We've now learned the skills to build finite abstract models, and finite abstract models are a particular type of interpretation meant to demonstrate semantic properties. Our finite abstract models so far have been limited to single place predicate logic. And so in this video, we're going to learn how to expand our skills so that we can generate finite abstract models for multi-place predicate logic, and also how we can do truth functional expansions in multi-place predicate logic. All the skills are the same, they just require a little bit more bookkeeping so that we can make sure we respect the relationships in our multi-place predicates. Here's an example of a two-place predicate. F2. One is faster than two. Now what I've done is I've defined it intentionally, which is the standard way that we do it when I give you something like a simplization question. Now how would we define this extensionally? Normally, extensionally, we would just say the set of all the things that belong to it. So if I had f somehow meant fast, I would just have all the fast things. But here, I have a relationship, one thing and another. So how can I actually just state all these things in a set? What we need is a sort of new apparatus that we can actually use to demonstrate relationships between two objects. And what we're going to use is something called an ordered pair. And an ordered pair has two members. In this case, I'm demonstrating with A as well as B. And the order of the pairing matters. So here, the ordered pair AB is not the same as the ordered pair BA. And AB has a particular order which says A comes first and B comes second. And of course, this should make sense because when I have some sort of relation that says uh, set one is faster than set two, so the first thing is faster than the second, order clearly matters. This way, we can actually collect a bunch of ordered pairs to define two-place relationships. So I can take a set of ordered pairs and put them together like so, and these things can actually express that they stand in a particular relation and anything not in the set doesn't. Now, of course, I can extend this beyond just ordered pairs. I can take ordered triples, ordered quadruples, and so on. And in general, I could define an ordered n tuple, which has n uh, elements in the ordering of it, and the order still matters. Given this, we can now extensionally define multiplace predicates. So if I wanted to define faster than, I would just have to put all the ordered pairs of things where one thing is faster than the other. So turtles, slugs, dogs, comma, ants, Andre de Grasse, and Alex Koo. And everything that is in the something is faster than the other relation would have to be in this extensionally predicate. Now, of course, this is unwieldy, but that's because we're not doing a nice small model, which is what we typically do when we do semantics. Uh, it's important to note, of course, that even though turtles, comma, slug is a member of F2 predicate, uh, slugs, comma, turtles is not a member of F2. And it, it's very important to remember that the order does not sort of flip naturally. Just because you have AB does not mean you have BA. The theory then is that every single n place predicate that we have can be defined extensionally by a set of ordered n tuples. And this is precisely how we're going to approach uh, generating a finite abstract model in an extensional way for multiplace predicate logic. It is worth pointing out that identity itself is sort of a special two-place relation, and we can have a natural definition of identity, extensionally speaking, as well. An identity is just defined as the set of ordered pairs of every single member of the universe with itself. And of course, that makes sense because identity means they are equal to each other. So this definition down here, where it says equals, says one is identical to one. 2 is identical to 2, 3 is identical to 3, and so on. Now, even though this is the case, if you ever see identity in one of your questions, do not include this information into your model. This is understood as the definition of identity, and it's worth knowing, but you don't have to stipulate it in your uh, models when you create them. Multiplace abstract translations is the next place we need to go. It's fine to know how to define things extensionally, but remember we come up with those extensional sort of sets based off of our understanding of what the abstract logic is sort of saying. So how do I make sense of for all x, gx, arrow, there exists a y, h, x, y? 
Now, if you sort of remember translations from uh, when we did symbolization, you'll know that a really good tip is that we focus on that H, X, Y uh, sort of final relationship. And so I could say something like X stands in the H relation to Y. But in fact, this is actually a really poor translation, and you want to avoid saying something that uses X's and Y's. So let's start clean, and I'll sort of walk you through how I like to abstractly translate this type of sentence. What I'm just going to say is more casually, I'm going to focus on, the, on that final relationship and just say that X H's Y. Or you can say X stands in the H relation to Y. But I really need to get rid of the X and the Y, because X and Y are not part of my abstract translation. They have no meaning, in fact. They are placeholders for something more important. So if you look at that X, what does that X mean? Well, it's tied to the quantifier for all X, and it's also tied to the G predicate. So instead of writing X, I should write all Gs. And of course, instead of writing uh, Y, I should just write something, because those are the quantifiers in question. Y is not just Y, it's something. Uh, that's sort of an abbreviation for something in my universe of discourse. Now, that's not good enough. All G's H something is actually not a precise enough abstract translation. Now, it might be good enough for sort of regular English, but logic is super precise. And what I want you to focus on is the order of the quantifiers in this statement. Here, the universal quantifier comes first, and then the existential quantifier comes second. And we know from symbolization that that doesn't just mean all G's H something. The problem with saying all G's H something is that is ambiguous. There are two ways to translate that. So in logic, it's not ambiguous at all. Because the existential comes after the universal, the correct translation of this is all G's H some non-specific thing, some generic thing, and that's because the existential comes after the universal. If we'd been looking at a different sentence where the existential comes first and then the universal comes second, notice that the actual structure of the rest of the sentence is identical. So this also means all G's H something, but of course that's not precise enough. What it really means is all G's H some specific thing. So we'll go into more detail of quantifier order later. I'm just hoping that you remember this from when we did ambiguous uh, symbolizations in multiplace logic. Okay, so now we know how to abstract translate our multiplace statements. Uh, we also know how to express these relationships in uh, a sets of ordered pairs or ordered triples and so on, depending on the size of the predicate. So let's actually go ahead and construct a finite abstract model that shows that this is invalid. Now the first step is going to generate that abstract translation. So I write out P1, P2 and negation of conclusion. And that negation of conclusion is of course because I want the conclusion to be false. So now I go ahead and abstractly translate. What does there exists x, fx, and gx mean? Fortunately, that's just in a single place predicate logic, and so that is straightforward. Something is f and g. Now, what does the second premise mean? Well, we actually just translated that thing on the previous slide, and so that means all g's h some non-specific thing. Finally, what is the correct translation of the conclusion? Now remember, the way I like to do this is to not actually translate the conclusion. Instead, I translate the negation of the conclusion. And this way, I just know to keep all these things true. I just find that easier in my head. Uh, but I don't really want to translate that. That has a weird negation in it, so I'm going to do my informal equivalence, and I'm going to move that negation in using quantifier negation, and then I'm going to negation of conditional, and uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, actually, that's not true. If you wanted to, you could do another negation of, uh, or sorry, another quantifier negation, and you could arrive at a for all y negation h, y, x if you wanted to. Really, you could stop at any of these points and abstractly translate it. I went the full distance, and now I have uh, this statement. It says there exists x, fx, and for all y, not h, y, x. Now, pause the video try and figure out how to abstractly translate that, and I'll walk you through it real quick in just a moment. Okay, so I hope you gave it a shot. 
Now we have our negation hyx that we're really focused on. Remember, to abstractly translate, we focus on the big relation at the end. That's really going to tell us how to sort of treat our relationships. So we know this really says y doesn't hx, y doesn't hx. But that's not good enough. What is the y? The y is the for all y, everything. And what is the x? The x is that there exists an x fx. So this really says everything does not h uh, sum f. But that's not good enough. I hope you remembered that quantifier order really makes a big difference. So the correct translation of this is everything does not h sum specific f. And adding that specific is really important because if you don't put that in, you might not have made it specific in your model and then it wouldn't be doing what you think it does. Now that we have the translations, we're ready to construct the model. As always, we start with the universe of discourse of 0 and 1, and we fiddle with it if we need to. Now I have f1 and g1, my single place predicates, but as you can see, I also included h2, which is my two place predicate. And h2 will be a set of ordered pairs. How do I make the first premise true? That's pretty much the most straightforward, easy place to start because it's an existential, doesn't involve any relationships. Something is f and g. What do you want that something to be? 0 or 1? Uh, you could, of course, pick 2, but then you'd have to add 2 to universe of discourse, and there's no real need to do that now. I'm just going to start with 0. Why not? It doesn't matter. So I can make the first premise true by inserting 0 into f and 0 into g, as I've just done. Now let's take a look at the second premise, uh, all g's h some non-specific thing. Well, uh, that one's sort of tricky. I'm actually not going to bother going there just yet. Sometimes you're going to go through and look at, a, look at a statement and say, I don't know how to do that, and that's fine. You should just move on and then come back to it later. So instead, it says everything does not h some specific f. Everything does not h some specific f. Okay, well, I can really pick what that f is, but right now I only have one thing in f, which is zero. So instead of saying everything does not h some specific f, I'm going to say everything does not h zero. And so when I take my notes, what this really means is I have to make sure I do not put something comma zero into my h2 predicate. Because something comma zero would mean that something does h zero. And the negation of conclusion says everything does not h some specific f, which I've deemed to be zero. So that's the little note that I have to take on. And as long as I make sure I remember that, I will solve this model. Now I'm ready to go back to premise two, all g's h some non-specific thing. Uh, OK, well. How many g's do I have? I just have one, and it's zero. So now I have to ask, what does it h? So I know that it will be in the h relation. It will be zero comma something, because the ordered pair captures the order of how things stand in the h relation. So all g's h some nonspecific thing. So that means this zero has to h something. Of course, the question is what? It could h the zero or it could h the 1. Uh, but of course, I have this little note that I've kept to myself, which is that no, it cannot h the 0, so it's got to be the 1. So this is just sort of some back and forth interplay. And um, what's sort of interesting about this example is that the generic, uh, or the nonspecific and the specific, didn't actually really come into play too, too much. But that's because this isn't that complicated of an example. And we'll look at more complicated examples later. But I just want to get you sort of comfortable with how we assess a multiplace predicate like h2. OK, well, to finish, I always check. Is something in f and g? Definitely. OK, something is f and g. That's the 0, so that sentence is true. Is it the case that all g's h some specific thing? Yes, or so non-specific thing, yes. G, there's only one, which is the zero, and it stands in the H relation to one, done. And is it the case that everything does not H some specific F? Yes, because I made sure that nothing stands in the H relation to zero, so we're good. These three statements are true, but of course, because the negation of conclusion is true, 
that means the conclusion itself is false and that is enough to show that this is invalid because there's a single interpretation or a model that makes all the premises true and the conclusion false at the same time. So to finish up, I close the set brackets to indicate that I'm done. And the final solution is always just the model. The other stuff is the side work. Uh, you can do it or not. Uh, I always do it because I find these questions tricky if I don't sort of have good bookkeeping. Here's another example. Let's make this argument invalid. Notice that I've made this argument far more complicated because I have a name letter, I, I even have an inequality in it, and so on. Um, and what I want you to do is pause the video and give it a shot to try and abstractly translate the three premises and the conclusion so that we can get started. Here's what I got for my translations. Premise one, if anything M's itself, then it is not an F. That's a nice group arrow property type statement. So if anything M's itself, because it's MXX, then that thing cannot be an F. Premise two is sort of the long and ugly one, but actually it's not so bad because it's just a string of conjunctions. And if it's a string of conjunctions, you can just sort of assert the facts. So the first fact is FA, which says A is an F. And then there's another fact which says FY, which says something is an F. But notice it also says A doesn't equal Y. So really what that says is there's another thing uh, that is F that is not A. And then we have these two properties, M-A-Y and negation M-Y-A. So that means my A stands in the M relation to the other F, but not the other way around. And so you can sort of write this as casually as you want, because the abstract translation is really just for you to sort of understand and keep track of what the meaning is. It's not some like sort of formal piece of work. The third premise is for all y, fy by conditional negation gy, and so everything is an f or g, but not both. We've seen that before. And the final um, thing that we have to abstractly translate is the conclusion. And that conclusion, I, I again like to put a negation in front of it. So that would be negation for all x, negation mxx. And how did I come up with something m's itself? Because I just did an informal equivalence where I did a quantifier negation and peeled off the two negations to get the negation of conclusion, meaning something M's itself. Now that we have that, we're ready to start. So we have our UD, F1, G1, A0 for the name letter and the M2 multiplace predicate. And we just have to pick the easiest places to start. And the easiest places to start are always existentials and name letters because they just tell us simple facts that we can make true. So let's go through this. Here it says A, my name letter, is an F. So remember how name letters work. Name letters pick out a single member of my universe of discourse. So immediately I'm just going to pick something arbitrarily, it doesn't matter, I pick zero. I always start with zero, it's just easy. Now. This is what A is, but I have to make sure that that A is an F. So it is a member of the F predicate. And the way you do that is you just put it in F. So I open the set and I put zero in there. Now I have made it true that A is an F. What else do I have to make true? Well, if you recall, the second premise says that there's a different F, something that's not A. Okay, that's not so bad. There is another thing in my universe of discourse, one, and I can put that in F. That will be my different thing. Once I have that, I'm ready to study the relation. The relation is my A M's a different F, but not the other way around. So here my A is zero, the different F is one. So that means that I must put zero one into my M2 predicate. Now the trick is, it's not the other way around, which means I can make a little note to myself that says, do not put one zero into M. And as long as I remember that, I'll be okay. So premise two, there was a lot of information there, but it was nice straightforward existential types of assertions. And that's why it's a really good place to start. Uh, where's the next sort of nice thing to sort of start with? Well, the other place where I have some sort of existential assertion, which is the negation of conclusion. And the negation of conclusion says something M's itself. 
So if you m yourself, that means whatever is in the first order part of the ordered pair is also in the second part of the ordered pair. Okay, well, what do we want? Uh, at this point, I'm not so sure. Should I pick 0? Should I pick 1? It doesn't really matter, and it's always smart to just guess. So I'm just going to guess 0 as my uh, object that ends itself. No problem. So I get 0, 0. Okay, uh, moving on, I can now look at premise 1. Why is premise 1 a reasonable uh, place to go next, as opposed to premise um, 3? Well, because premise 1 says something about M's itself. So there's sort of like a natural flow towards premise 1. Okay, well, what does premise 1 say? It says if anything M's itself, then it's not an F. But I do have something that satisfies that antecedent. Something does M itself. 0, 0 is an M, so 0 ends itself. But this is a problem, because premise 1 says it cannot be an F. So the problem is it is already in F. And I can't really change that, because that came uh, from premise 2, which sort of stipulated all these things. So this is a problem. Uh, what do I do? Uh, well, I have to go back to my negation of conclusion, which is something ends itself, and sort of fix this. I clearly can't pick 0 to be my object, so I'm sort of going to scrub that out from my model. But you might think, okay, well my only other option is 1, and I'm going to encounter the same problem. If I put 1, 1 in there, then premise 1 says, if anything ends itself, which is 1, then it's not an F, but 1 is also an F, so I'm stuck. Now, when you're stuck in this situation, this is when you know that your universe is not big enough. And what you really need is another member of your universe of discourse for you to make it work. So I immediately add another object to my universe of discourse, which is this 2. And now I know that I can safely make this happen. I can pick this other member to be the thing that ends itself, i.e. to satisfy the negation of conclusion. And to ensure that I satisfy premise 1, I just need to make sure that 2 is not an F, which I have done. Now that I've taken care of premise 1 and made sure that I preserve the truth of the negation of conclusion, I'm ready to move on to the final premise, which is premise 3. And that says everything is in F or G, but not in both. Now, so far, everything is just an F in the 0 and 1 sense, and it's actually the 2 that is uh, not in F or G. Now, I just need to be careful here. I could put it in F, but then I would have the problem because that's going to conflict with uh, my if anything ends itself, then it's not an F, and so on. So this just becomes a sort of interplay back and forth where you really just have to sort of make sure that you're not uh, sort of screwing up a previous statement that you made successfully true. So the easiest way to make this true is to just put the last element, which is 2, into G because G doesn't seem to mess around with anything else in my model. Last thing to do is, of course, to check everything. Is it true that if anything ends itself, then it is not an F? Yes, that's true. Only 2 ends itself, and it's not an F. Is it true that A is an F and etc., etc., all that premise 2 stuff? Actually, yeah, that was the easiest one to make, make true. And of course, we had this note, do not put 1, 0 into M, so we didn't. Uh, in premise 3, is it true that everything is an F or G but not both? Yes, that is true. And finally, is it true that something does M itself? It is. And of course, the truth of that means that our conclusion is false, and so we are done. We close all the sets, and our final answer is just that model.